Hey y'all, welcome back for another episode of MD Tribe. This week we have Dr. Khan, who is an osteopathic physician practicing as an ICU physician. So I'm really excited to interview her. She provides amazing perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what she thinks is gonna happen after the vaccine comes out. She also talks about her experience getting into medical school when she had an 8% chance of matriculating. And she still managed to get through medical school, graduated with a 3.8 GPA, got accepted into the residency of her dreams, and now she is working as a physician. She has her own platform called The Female Doc, and she does amazing work empowering medical students, especially minority medical students, by coaching and mentoring them to get into medical school and to further diversify the medical field. So I'm really excited to collaborate with her and be able to share a snippet of her journey and her story. So without further ado, here's MD Tribe. of MD Tribe. This week we have Dr. Khan, which I'm really excited to interview. So without further ado, can you please go ahead and tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm Dr. Rosie Khan, and I am a double board certified critical care doctor. I'm also a doctor of osteopathic medicine. I trained at Toro University and graduated medical school in 2008. Then I completed three years of an internal medicine residency in Southern California uh, and finished that in 2011. And then I did two years of a critical care fellowship uh, and graduated in 2013. And I've been a practicing physician now for eight years. Awesome. So what initially brought you to pursue a career in medicine? So uh, it's, it's always been like a childhood fascination of mine. And um, my mother is actually an ob physician and she practiced in Pakistan. She was not able to practice in the United States, but um, early on I would kind of browse some of her old medical books and things like that. So um, then it kind of got my, my interest sparked in science. And then of course, when you're, you're a little girl and you tell everyone you wanna be a doctor, you get a lot of positive reinforcement. So um, I just decided that that's what I wanted to do and there was nothing else that I wanted to do. And as I continued on through like my volunteer college experiences and shadowing, it just continued to reinforce that this is exactly where, where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Awesome, did you have passions outside of medicine that you kept up with like throughout the years? Yeah, I'm actually a total nerd. Um, so I actually really loved coding. So I'm a WordPress developer. And okay. yeah, so I, I started in uh, high school. I took AP Computer Science and I learned C++. And at the time, HTML was the big language. And uh, most of you are probably too young to remember this, but MySpace was a really popular uh, social media platform and you could code your own backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and because I knew HTML, I would code my own like profile background. And I, uh, I loved coach purses at the time, so I would make all these different coach purse patterns for my MySpace background. But um, after I finished fellowship, um, I just hadn't really practiced coding in a long time, but my first job out of fellowship was out in Saginaw, Michigan, which is 100 miles north of Detroit. But in Detroit, there, there is a group called Girl Develop It. And um, we meet up at coffee shops and we code. Um, and it's just a bunch of amazing women in the tech field. Um, so I started hanging out with them and I just polished up and refreshed all my coding skills. So that's one of the like, really nerdy things that I do. <laughs> That's really cool. My brother is actually um, into like the whole coding and he does like web design and app development. And I'm like, you can have all that. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it's cool that you do both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think as a scientist, we just like math and science are kind of our jam. And I just, I love experimenting with that kind of stuff. 
I also love to dance. Um, you know, growing up Pakistani, my my mom taught me a lot of like Bollywood dances, and so I do that a lot. <laughs> oh, very cool. So, yeah. mom was an OBGYN, right? Did you ever have an inkling to go into um, OBGYN? I did. It was actually my first rotation as a third year med student, and um, I completely loved it. I loved the clinic. I loved being on the wards, delivering. I loved being in the OR, C-sections, and other gynecological procedures and surgeries. And um, it was six weeks. And then the next six weeks was my pediatric rotation. And I hated that so much that I would sneak down to the ob clinic to help out some of my friends who were like doing that rotation at the time. And I was showing them the ropes of the clinic and all the attendings noticed. And, and uh, but then uh, later that year in November, I did internal medicine and I was like, oh, well, Sorry, OB. <laughs> I guess I'm. I guess I'm gonna be an internist and go down this path. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I kind of want to go back a little bit. I guess we're jumping around, but I kind of want to go back and know what your journey was like to medical school. I know um, coming across your Instagram, this is what initially struck my eye because I knew you mentioned your MCAT was like on the lower range, um, yeah. and your GPA, you know was on the lower range as well. And I think you calculated like you had an 8% chance of getting into medical school. I did, it was really bad. So um, I was one of those, you know, 4.2 GPA, AP class heavy um, high school students. Um, high school was easier for me. The sciences and maths got me all riled up. I was excited, but I think one thing that um, a lot of first generation students struggle with and just um, people of color in general is that sometimes we grow up a little bit more culturally conservative. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, our parents set a lot of structure for us. And when we go to college, we no longer have that structure and uh, we don't get it from our professors and we definitely um, don't get it from our parents anymore. We're becoming a little bit more independent. And so my study habits were not there because it was all externally created for me throughout high school. So I didn't really know how to study. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I had very loving and caring teachers growing up, uh, especially in math and science. And then all of a sudden, um, my biology professor in college is saying like, look to your right, look to your left, look at the three people in front of you, the three people behind you, only one of you is gonna be a doctor. You know, and that kind of negativity really um, struck me and uh, just how terrible some of the professors are because, you know, now looking back, I realize that the university is primarily a, a, a grounds for research. So many of our professors, while they may not have been the strongest teachers, were extremely talented researchers. And so that's why they had the positions that they did. And um, it doesn't really help the students. And so my freshman year of college, I had a 2.5 GPA. I got two Bs and two Cs each semester. Uh, so not a great start to the pre-med journey, but it continued to actually just get worse. I, I ended up dropping my biology major and I switched to psychology because I, I took AP psychology in high school and I knew I really loved that. So I switched hoping that it would spark some of that passion that I felt back in high school because I wasn't getting that in biology and chemistry anymore. Yeah. And then um, I, was, I was doing well in my psychology classes, but then um, again, it was just like organic chemistry and physics and I struggled through those classes. I continued to get B's and C's. But in my mind, I was still convinced. I'm like, there's no way this is actually what medical school is like, because this yeah. is terrible. You know, this, and I tell this to pre-med students all the time. The sciences are so dry and so boring and terrible. And like med school really isn't like that. Med school is much more interesting because you're actually learning about the human body and you know you can make an impact on that when you gain that type of knowledge. Whereas organic chemistry is so it's the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst. So, so then I was like, okay, well, forget it. I'm going to smash the MCATs and then everyone's going to ignore this like terrible GPA. My science GPA was 
then um, then I take the MCAT and, and I did terribly. I, I scored a 32nd percentile, um, which back then it was a two digit score. So that was a 22. Mm -hmm. um, and I just decided, well, maybe it was denial or maybe it was a deep, deep knowing that I was going to make it no matter what. I don't, I don't know what it was, but I just kept going. Um, everyone, like my pre-med advisor was just like, you know, you need to pick another career. And I was like, nah, <laughs> I don't think so. So I applied anyway. I applied to 12 MD schools, four DO schools. And then I realized that um, I loved osteopathic medicine a lot more. Um, and my mentor, she's an osteopathic physician and she was the one I would shadow a lot. So mm -hmm. then towards as secondary started rolling around, I really focused in on those four DO schools. I got two interviews and I got one acceptance. And I guess that's all you need, right? It's just, you just need to get in to one place. Yeah, I would definitely echo that because I applied to four ND schools and three DO schools. Um, I love both, you know, I guess philosophies and I was indifferent. All I cared about was becoming a physician, which is why I applied to both. Um, and I also only got one acceptance. Um, and then when I got my acceptance, I kind of just like, you know, ignored the other interviews because I, I went to FSU and I loved FSU. So I was like, this is perfect, you know, um, yeah. but definitely one interview and well, one acceptance is all you need. So yeah. that's yeah. awesome. I'm so happy you made it through and now you're saving lives in the right. medical pandemic. So thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> And what was your experience like transitioning to medical school? So I know a lot of the big concerns for allowing students that, you know, maybe aren't so competitive kind of stirs people away thinking that they might not succeed. What was your transition like? Were you able to do well in medical school? Yeah, it was medical school, I will say, is a completely different ballgame. It is just really interesting material. I mean, it's a large volume and it is difficult. But it's just so much more interesting. Your motivation's a little bit more different. Um, and I think because it becomes more important to you and you've also worked so hard as a pre-med for that upward trend to get in, that you, you, sh you probably go into medical school with some good study habits. And I, I ended up graduating with a 3.8 in medical school mm -hmm. because I had grown so much and I knew how important this was to me and my future. Um, and, but what's so interesting is I'll never forget this initial conversation I had with one of my classmates and she was Indian. And so um, like we come from a very competitive culture and just like making our parents proud. And there's, there's a lot of cultures that mirror this as well, but I was gonna give myself grace to just like get through med school because it's supposed to be so hard. And, and she said to me, she's like, oh no, I'm aiming for straight A's because that's what my parents deserve. And I was like, what? <laughs> Are you serious? And I felt a little bit of shame because I'm like, oh, I really wasn't aiming for straight A's for that. But then at the same time, I was kind of like, well, why not? Let's see what happens. Let's see how this goes. And um, I ended up just loving it. And, um, and then it, your pre-med, your pre-med colleagues, like they become kind of a family. And I, I used to share my notes all the time. Um, I, I've heard horror stories at other medical schools, but I've never heard of this type of like gunner mentality as a med student in osteopathic medical schools per mm -hmm. se. So it was a very warm environment. We all shared notes. Of course, there's like a couple of gunners, handful of gunners, but the rest of us were pretty much a community. And would share our mnemonics and things like that. And I went to medical school in a time when there was <laughs> no smartphone. So <laughs> it was hard. we had to share notes because there was no dictation system. You had to pay, the students had to all collectively pay for someone to dictate uh, a lecture or something. And none of us did that. So yeah, it was, it was a good community. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely think, I, at least at my medical school, the community is very nice. Like everybody is, helps each other. It's collaborative. Um, even if there are gunners, they kind of like are on their own, you know, and they don't really, yeah. like, they're not in your face and stuff like that. So I definitely appreciate that as well. Yeah. And did you have any, I, I would say, did you ever feel like um, 
you had imposter syndrome when you were in medical school? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I battled imposter syndrome and I still do sometimes. I, I think it's, it's more of a journey rather than a completion of like, oh, I've completely overcome it. Um, but all the time in med school, especially when I was applying for residencies, there were so many rumors going around that later on I found were just completely false. But um, I wanted to get into an internal medicine residency that was an AOA program at the time. Now, obviously, the graduate education system is completely different and it's just all combined AOA and ACGME. But um, there were only four spots for this internal medicine program and like every DO wanted it. It was in Southern California Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. But the rumor was that there was, it was the program director was going to pick two men and two women and then two people from Western University and two people from Taro University. And um, one of my classmates, Christina, was just a beast. And so she was definitely a shoe in So she took a female spot and she took a Toro University spot. But then there was this other female that like everyone liked at Western and all this stuff. So I was just like, oh, I'm definitely not gonna get in. And there were just these ridiculous rumors. Um, I, and I just kept, I kept doing what I did best, which was just try anyways, because yeah. anyone saying a no to you, it, it, it just bruises your ego. But other than that, there's really no significant consequence. Mm -hmm. um, like that persistence is very, very key in medicine. And so um, I was like, well, I guess I don't know if I deserve to be here or whatever, but I'm going to apply anyway. And I actually ended up getting one of the spots and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that it was a very competitive year, um, especially since there were only four spots. But then it's so funny because I had a, a conversation with my assistant program director later, um, Dr. Leah Katz, and I told her this story and she looked at me. She was like, you know how ridiculous that is, right? She's like, we don't look, we don't create like ratios of like the female to men and um, this particular college versus the other one. And um yeah, and there was also a rumor that the other female candidate um, would go over to her house and bake cookies. <laughs> I asked her about that, and she was like, how stupid do you think I am to invite a medical student over to bake cookies at my house? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then and I think the more you peel away at when you're feeling like an imposter, and really take the time to reflect back on how ridiculous your thoughts were. And it could have been your thoughts that hindered you or that um, would have stopped you from a particular opportunity. When you learn that relationship, then you start to learn to ignore those thoughts. Like the thoughts are always going to be there. You know, I think that's just human where it's just like, you can't do it. Or are you sure you're not good enough for this? But you just apply anyways and you just keep going. Like for example, right now I'm on two steering committees with the uh, American College of Chess Physicians. And the first year I applied, I didn't get into any, but then the second year is when I got in. And, and so imagine if I would have given up. You yeah. Know, I wouldn't have been able to sit on these committees and lead national policies and things. So That's amazing. And I definitely echo that as well, because I feel like I, I tend to do a lot of scholarship applications, but some of the scholarship mm -hmm. applications the first time around, I didn't get it, you know, and had I, you know, stuck to that and not applied again, I wouldn't have got it the second time around. And several scholarships that I've gotten, it's on the second time that I applied and like showed that persistence. Uh, so definitely. Yeah. What was your experience like applying to residency aside from, you know, thinking people are baking cookies <laughs> and stuff like that? Um, you know, how many programs did you apply to? What was your experience like as a DO? Because I, I know that the, this stigma continues to uh, persist in our society. Um, so, you know, what's your opinion on that? And what was your experience like? Sure. I think that's, I think it's mostly a stigma. Um, I think osteopathic medicine is becoming more well known. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 151,000 of us in the United States now, which makes up 11% of the entire uh, practicing physician population. Um, so uh, I wanted to stay in the state of California because that's where I would, uh, grew up. 
and um, there's not too many AOA uh, residency spots. Um, there's only two osteopathic medical schools in the state of California. So I've primarily applied to internal medicine ACGME positions, I think. I want to say I applied to 12. Maybe it was 24. Mm -hmm. I pretty much applied to like almost all of them. Um, and I just, I mean, I just threw my hat in the bag and saw what happened. I had several interviews, but at the time when I was going through the match process, the AOA match occurred first, uh, which worked out well for me because the AOA program at Arrowhead was my number one choice. And then all the ACGMEs were, you know, second, third, fourth choices. Um, so it worked out for me before students used to have to pick. Like if they had a second choice AOA and a first choice ACG me, they would have to forego the AOA match and then just completely bank on ACG me, which is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. But, but that's um, combined, correct? Now it's combined, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no more worry about that. But yeah, I just, um, I went to several different interviews. I played the game. I, 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 I guess naturally, like to, in order for me to get into medical school, I created like a whole system and it's still a system that I use to this day. It's a formula really. And that's what I teach my pre-med students. And I, I've just continued to use it to get ahead and like network and be likable and how to showcase my hard work without bragging and being obnoxious and things like that. So um, it's a skill that I learned and I, and that's what I think really helped me get noticed. Um, yeah. So Residency wasn't, it was extremely stressful because I wanted to get into this residency program so desperately. And um, all of the stressors, I re looking back now, all came from rumors that were just not true, you know? And so I, I, I worried for no reason. Mm -hmm. As an internal medicine um, applicant, what do you think you had that helped you stand out? Um, I, I mean, I got good grades in medical school. My um, my board exam scores were were pretty good, um, above average. But I think um, during rotations, audition rotations in particular, I was just beast mode. I would show up early. I would leave late. I never complained. Um, during my internal medicine rotation. I did seven admissions in one call night um, just because I wanted to be that machine that made it so easy for them to say yes to me, mm -hmm. to show them like, well, if you think, if this is what I'm like as a medical student, imagine what I'm like as a resident yeah. and what I would do with the program. And at the time it was paper charts. And so what I would do is as a med student, I would, once we did like a COPD, exacerbation admission, um, a bacterial pneumonia community acquired admission, I would photocopy the orders. So then I could continuously write orders. I wanted to make my, my residents life as easy as possible. And so I would fill out forms, I would write orders, I would continue to practice as a resident. And then the residents just had to sign the orders, look them over, sign them. I mean, now with electronic records, it's a little bit more different, but you can still make your residence life extremely easy by gathering and collecting all of that information and presenting it to them so that they can just say yes or no, or like, yes, we'll do that. No, we won't do this. Okay. And then, yeah, you try and, and another piece of advice is never ever ask an attending or a resident something you can Google. It is legitimately the most annoying thing ever. And it shows a lack of initiative. And I think because I did so much work up front on my rotations that I, I'm sure that no matter what my scores were, um, that I would have been able to succeed. And that's also what got me into fellowship as well, is that I, I worked like someone's life depended on it. I think sometimes you lose sight of that when you're in training and you're just exhausted. But if you're constantly like, how can I be the best at what I do? And how can I completely learn this craft? Then there's, people are gonna notice and no one's gonna stop you. 
And so because I work so hard in residency as well, even though it's like I'm in and I'm going to get this job now um, because I debated a lot in fellowship. But then when it came down to writing my letters of recommendation, you know, all of my attendings would have said every said the most amazing things about me and that I was a hard worker. Yeah. So I think that's what got me into fellowship. That's awesome. And I definitely think the same thing where now, I mean, medical school can be daunting at times, you know, it's a lot of information coming in. And sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, you're just like, as long as it's in, it's in there somewhere, it'll come out when it needs to come out. Right. Um, But I think sometimes I have to, you know, remind myself like, no, you need to learn this very well and understand it because one day, you know, I'm going to have a patient that is going to come down to this information and it's whether I learned it or not, you know? Um, so I definitely think that is very important, you know, concept as a medical student and at, you know, any level as a resident, a fellow and so on and so forth. So I know you decided to go into critical care. At what stage did you, um, cause I know, so internal medicine can be very broad and you have a lot of like subspecialties. So kind of, can you walk us through how you decided what subspecialty to do and what it was like, you know, going to fellowship? Sure. So um, I loved critical care. I did a medical IC rotation as a fourth year medical student. Um, My mentor at the time, uh, Dr. Mark Robinson, was an incredible attending and um, really had just such grace and poise and empathy as an IC physician that was paired with so much deep scientific knowledge and it was really inspiring. So um, that really motivated me and I love the challenge of the ICU. Uh, But then when I was an intern in residency, I did my ICU rotation and I was totally burnt out and exhausted. And ICU was the hardest rotation that of for me that year. And I decided I, I can't do this. There's no way I'm I'm gonna do this for a living. I'm just I'm gonna I'll be happy as a hospitalist. I like that and it's fine. But then second and third year when my burnout started to go away, I started to realize like, oh, I really like the ICU. And so I did a, a few more electives in ICU. And I was still debating. I wasn't completely tied to it. I was also um, worried about my parents. And I think a lot of people of color think about this as well, because you are the financial tap to your family, right? You're the ones who are pulling them out of their um, financial mess. You are the American dream, right? So everything's kind of riding on you as you kind of go through this. So I didn't know if I wanted to dedicate another two years of being broke (laughs) as a trainee for fellowship and if that would be worth it. And I look back now and I'm like, oh, it's completely worth it. You should definitely do it if you're thinking about doing a fellowship and just take that financial hit for two more years. Um, But there was one night when um, there was an attending that I, I didn't really like and there is an ICU physician shortage and So he was assigned to cover the ICU for the weekend. So typically in in areas that have a shortage of an ICU physician, a hospitalist will round on the ICU patients for the weekend or on nights or whatever the case may be. Um, And so he was scheduled to round on the patients that weekend and I was so irritated. I I was so mad because I don't, I mean, that's part of the thing that I think pushes some of us to in medicine is we see the gaps in, in another burned out physician and we want to fill that and be like, no, you know, you need to come at it with more empathy or you can't just tell someone that, you know, your mom's not going to make it and then walk out of the room. Like, that's not right. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think I decided exactly in that moment, in that, that night, um, that I, I, wouldn't allow myself to stop because um, if there were physicians like him that had to cover an ICU because there was a a shortage, I would have to fill that gap. I felt like it was my duty. Mm -hmm. So like your calling. Yeah, it was my calling. So then I applied. (laughs) 
<laughs> so what's uh, your experience been like now? I know now you're doing a little bit of travel work, right? With the COVID yeah. pandemic. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit. I'm sure you have a whole soapbox on this. <laughs> but tell us about your experience and, um, you know, the good, the bad, things that open your eyes, anything. Yeah. So with the COVID pandemic, I switched to being a locum tenens physician, and that's um, Latin for um, holding a, a place. And so essentially what you do is you're an independent contractor and um, you pair with these um, physician recruiting companies and they will pay for your travel expenses and put you up in a hotel near a hospital that is desperate for um, you know, a particular specialty of physicians. So obviously in the pandemic, it was IC physicians. So it, it was grueling. I mean, I worked um, 84 hour weeks, which is, I mean, our shifts are 12 hour shifts. So, uh, and then I was flipping in between days and nights sometimes. Um, and I was flying back and forth between two hospitals. So whenever my shift was like my week was over at one hospital, I would get on a plane and go to the next one and then work another week um, because there was just such a shortage of IC physicians. So I did this for almost eight weeks straight. I mean, I had a few days off here and there, but it was exhausting. And I was basically just living out of a hotel, which when you initially say that, it sounds like, oh my God, that's so luxurious. I wish, um, I could have a maid to come and clean, but because of the pandemic, the, you know, cleaners weren't coming into the hotel rooms to clean and, and which was appropriate because I was fully exposed in, in front of COVID-19 patients. So I didn't want them coming in and cleaning the room. So the yeah. room got kind of gross. And then at the same time, it's not like I was at the Five Seasons Resort. Uh, like a lot of the hospitals that I was going to were in communities that were at need. So it was like very motel-esque so they weren't like luxury hotels it was not cute it was it was exhausting it was emotionally exhausting it was very lonely um uh it was nice to at least be able to go to work and interact with adults and you know i got to hang out with all of my nursing colleagues and um other physicians but yeah it was it was a trying time um, and I'm still doing it right now. I'm, I'm kind of flying all over. Um, and then on my uh, weeks off, I work on my pre-med program and work with my pre-med student. So. Oh, that's awesome. And I definitely want to touch a little bit upon that. But before I do, um, I did want to ask, how do you feel uh, with the vaccine coming out? Do you think or how long do you think it will be until things start improving? Yeah. Um, in 2009, with the swine flu pandemic, the uh, initial vaccine came out 174 days after the start of the pandemic. So this has taken a little bit longer, which isn't completely unexpected because the swine flu pandemic was just a strain of flu. And we had already had a, established a baseline of a flu vaccine. Right, so we, there was no such thing as a coronavirus vaccine, even though we've had things like SARS and MERS before. Uh, so this is the first vaccine um, targeted to that virus. So I, I knew it would take longer. Um, but I mean, we really saw the numbers go down and we have not seen swine flu return. I returned briefly in 2013. So the 2009 strain reemerged in 2013, but we have not seen it ever again it's never been a pandemic since 2009 and the reason why is because of the vaccine so whenever you go for your annual flu vaccine you may or may not know this but it also includes a strain against swine flu which is h1n1 mm -hmm. so I, think, I think the coronavirus vaccine um will be successful just like all other vaccines and it's not the first time that like a new vaccine has come out and it's just the first one that's actually getting media coverage. When I was growing up, there was no such thing as a chicken pox vaccine. I just got chicken pox. Um, and then when I was um, starting clinical rotations, they checked my chicken pox titers and I wasn't immune enough. So I had to get booster shots. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the first ones to receive the chicken pox vaccine as well. Yeah. Um, 
the HPV vaccine came out when I was in medical school and I was still within the age range of nine to 25. So in that first round, I took the HPV vaccine. And you're alive and doing completely well. So. <laughs> I'm alive and doing well. And I don't, I mean, I guess Bill Gates has been tracking me <laughs> with his 5G towers now for um, at least a decade. So I'm fine. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, the, the, the vaccines are, it's, it's science, right? Um, it is just micro dosing of, even if it is, if you want to define it as chemicals, it's micro dosing of that. And that's extremely important for the human body. If you think about it, carpet is synthetic. We are constantly exposed to synthetic material, but the human body is so resilient that we are able to adapt to these environments, right? We don't live in the forest anymore. We're constantly surrounded by synthetic material. And in fact, studies show that children who grow up in a carpeted house have less rates of asthma. And it's because the micro dosing, that small exposure to um, different synthetic environmental factors builds a resilience within our human body. So it's extremely important for young children to be exposed early on. And, and that's how our immune system builds itself. Like my father grew up in Pakistan and he can eat anything and not get sick. <laughs> and I have a very American stomach. I was born here in California and it's very difficult for me to travel and eat foreign foods sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just don't have the immunity for it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm excited for the vaccine. It's not a big deal. Um, it's microdosing. It's science. Yeah. Awesome. I, well, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you've been doing because I know it takes a lot of sacrifice and it's scary and terrifying and you're literally in the front lines in your bubble suit. <laughs> so I genuinely really appreciate that. But I do want to dive into um, your pre-med stuff because I think what you're yeah. doing is phenomenal and I know you're expanding now to start a podcast and I'm very excited for that. I'm like always commenting on your stories. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the support. No problem. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what your program is like and how students can get connected. Yeah, so my... Um, program is the most comprehensive medical school application program that's out there and it's specifically tar targeted to people of color, women, uh, immigrants, first generation kids, uh, L and the LGBTQ community. Essentially like any minority or marginalized group in medicine because my mission with my company is to increase the diversity of physicians. Um, and because of this and because of my own story I've I've created a formula that allows students to stand out and still be a competitive applicant despite having low scores. And uh, minority students are more likely to have low scores just because of the lack of opportunities, the lack of funds to expensive prep courses, things like that. So I want to try to fill in that gap. And it's a year long program. So you have access to the entire program for a whole year. And the, and the reason why I do that is because it's the application, there's so many important pieces to the application process. Like a lot of pre-med students will focus in on a personal statement, but that's not the only way that you can hustle and create strategy and how to get into medical school. Um, I have worked behind the scenes in admissions for medical schools, residencies, and fellowships. Um, and yeah, I did that for 11 years and I, and I started to see what adcoms were really focusing in on and it's not the stuff that pre-meds think is important. Mm -hmm. um, and because I've been such a strong writer and a strong networker, those are the type of skills that I, I really teach and I really teach storytelling psychology. Mm -hmm. um, having a psychology major was extremely helpful to me um, sort of marketing myself and, and not in a braggadocious kind of way. And so, um, so I call that the future doctor formula. And um, if you want to learn more about it, I have a free masterclass that um, people can go check out, or if you want to just check out the program. So it's thefemaledoc.com slash premed for the masterclass, or you can go to thefemaledoc.com slash future doctor formula to check out the program. 
Awesome. And I'll definitely include it in the description box and all that good stuff so people can get connected. And what kind of sparked your interest to start your podcast? Oh, well, I, um, I have a lot to say. <laughs> I have a lot of opinions, but I think what I really wanted, and I'm, and I, and this is what you're doing as well, is that women of color need larger platforms. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about these things because um, our viewpoints are so different. And um, like, I've, I've always kind of been what I would call an academic feminist. So I've, I, I'm deep into the medical research of it all. I, I do my own gender dynamic research within healthcare. Um, and it, it's just an, a different viewpoint that I think is very, very important. And I wanna be able to amplify those type of voices mm -hmm. um, and have these conversations about racism, sexism, homophobia, and again, to increase my mission of increasing the diversity of um, physicians in the United States. Definitely. And I love that. I'm always saying, I'm always saying that women in medicine, especially minority women in medicine, we're like a different breed. Like we just, yeah. we function at a different <laughs> level. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And I think it's, it's because of the resilience that was built into us because we were able to succeed in this, in a system that uh, was not built for us, right? The system was built for white men to succeed. So, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of leads me into my last question and I kind of always conclude my podcast with these questions with this question and it's if with all your experience so far and you know everything that you've been through everything um that you've learned can you offer at least two golden nuggets to a pre-med or a woman in medicine or any minority in medicine um or that wants to pursue a career in medicine what would you what would you tell them yeah I would tell them what I what I I still consistently tell pre-med students is that don't take yourself out of the game until someone has actually said no. Meaning, not a pre-med advisor, but apply to medical school anyways, no matter what people say, and apply with a strategy. I mean, don't just like waste a bunch of your money, but apply with a strategy. And then when med schools say no, it doesn't have to be a final no. Figure out how you want to pivot, because that's that's what life is all about. And the second piece of advice is age is completely irrelevant. When you're in your 20s, you feel like time is flying by and that you're not going to be able to accomplish everything you want to accomplish. And women also tend to start planning for this phantom future family that they don't even have yet. And what I'd like to say to that is that because I've been able to go so hard in on my career, I now have power and flexibility to do whatever I want as a mother. Mm -hmm. And so if I would have not taken these harder opportunities, not pursued fellowship, things like that, because I was scared I would be too old or because I wouldn't have enough time for this family that hadn't arrived yet, then I would have done myself a huge disservice. Yeah. You know, and so just keep going, do whatever you want to do and live in the moments and just try to be a better person than you were the day before and just keep going with your dreams and goals. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview and share your experiences and, you know, continuing to empower women, especially minorities in medicine. We need more, as much empowerment as we can get uh, to diversify the field. So thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing. Sure. Thanks for, for putting your voice out there too. It's really important. No problem. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Bye.